have all of the mass media and are able to manipulate people's opinions, then you ask that question, when is Cuba going to change? But actually, as I say, Cuba always is changing, but the United States policy is the same. And uh, it's really ridiculous because if you think about it, a country that close to, Cuba, to the United States with so many cultural and historic ties and so much common history and common culture, and then for 50-something years the United States has been denying people in the United States the right to travel to Cuba. And, you know, the arts have been one of the, 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 the main areas of breaking that down. And in fact, uh, both music and then dance and ballet has been, you know, one of the things where there's been collaboration and people traveling back and forth and performing and participating in events. Well, I picked Cuba because a lot of great, great dancers have come from here. And I think it's a good experience to come here and see it for yourself. I was really excited to come to Cuba for, for the dance and for the country and what I'd heard, everybody's now, especially everybody's always like, oh, Cuba, you're going to Cuba, oh my God, I want to go to Cuba, everybody wants to go to Cuba. Why not when it's like one of the best places to train? It's really like Puerto Rico, a lot of places, they're really similar, so I kind of feel like I'm at home, <laughs> but it's really, it's really great, and the people here too are really nice. She's in Cuba getting some support from their homeland brethren living in the U.S., places like Union City, New Jersey, and Miami. Had President Trump allowed the Obama doctrine to continue with Americans doing business with Cuba, would there now be shortages of food and medicine, especially at a time when the coronavirus is winning on the island nation? From Union City, here's New Jersey reporter Anthony Johnson. The voices of change are ringing loud and clear. Hundreds gathered on the streets of North Bergen and West New York to show their support for reform in Cuba. Cuba should be free, no matter what, what it takes. Call the government, call U.S. Biden, they should be on top of this, no matter what. The Republican gubernatorial candidate in New Jersey joined the protest. While some argue the GOP is trying to thwart voting rights in this country, he says he supports the right to vote for all. 
especially those in Cuba. What would you like to see happen in Cuba? First thing I'd like to see is for us to provide some medicine and food. When people are crying out for the most basic of human rights, America always runs to the rescue. It's time to do that, particularly for a country whose border is 90 miles from our shores. The protest in Hudson County, New Jersey, was just as spirited as a similar protest by Cuban Americans in South Florida, where they shut down a major highway. The calls for change are growing in this country and putting pressure on the Biden administration to take decisive action. This shows the united force that we have with our Cuban brothers and sisters that are suffering every day on the island. The repression in Cuba is escalating on the island nation. Meanwhile, the protesters here vow to keep up the momentum and their efforts to see a free and democratic Cuba. From the streets of Havana to the streets of West New York, New Jersey, the protests continue to grow in support of Cuban liberation. Now, on the 19th. Protesters shutting down the Palmetto, flooding the expressway for hours, marching with a message to the Cuban government. We need freedom! We need freedom! The demonstration causing traffic chaos on the 826. Crowds of Cuban Americans also rallying in other parts of South Florida. It is night number three as they show their support and call for change on the island. This is for the Cuban people. They need liberty. And Cuban police out in force in the country streets, backing down on residents trying to rise up. Plus, a stern warning from Washington. Allow me to be clear. If you take to the sea, you will not come to the United States. From South Florida to Cuba, people demanding democracy. These people are asking for liberty. The people that are here, they're willing to go to Cuba and die. But these people are asking for liberty and they want to make sure that Biden hears this scream. They want to make sure that Biden at least has a statement saying we acknowledge what's going on and we need to do something about it. Here's what they did about it. On about one of the busiest expressways in town. From around lunchtime well through the evening rush. These are the real people that are suffering that got family members in Cuba now dying. What are you he- sick? What are you hearing from family? They're dying. We don't want food. We don't want vaccines. We want help. We need communism to end. I'm here be- for freedom, freedom and, and justice for Cuba. Heartbroken and heated over images that recently surfaced from their homeland. The calls for help were clear. This needs to end. Biden, please, we beg you. Please help out our families that are over there that are dying of hunger. Raw emotion flowed as rain fell. What? Cuba, on the north coast facing the Gulf of Mexico, is today one of the most progressive cities of the Western Hemisphere. A bird's eye view of the city reveals the many landmarks of its progress and growth. Here we see the imposing chimneys of the Taya Piedra electric plant, which catch the eye from miles. The new electric plant at Regla is seen across the harbor. We have here the monument to Jose Marti at the Plaza de la República, erected to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Republic and surrounded by other national buildings. The heavy traffic of the city is reflected on Rancho Polleros Avenue. This constellation at the Rancho Polleros Airport is a symbol of the country's progress in air travel. Old 
Carlos Tercero Street is now a spacious modern avenue. The Palace of Fine Arts, where a sculpture at the entrance proclaims the high standard of the plastic arts in Cuba. One of Havana's maternity hospitals. The baby population in Cuba is growing rapidly. A new waterwork system with a 78-inch pipeline is being constructed in the southern basin of Havana province to meet the increasing water consumption of the greater Havana area. The University of Havana, one of the most advanced in the Americas, proud of its cultural traditions. The large Masonic temple, recently erected by Cuban Masonic bodies. The new electromechanics building at Belen College. The functional style of the Miramar Yacht Club distinguishes its architecture from that of other aristocratic clubs on this seafront. An up-to-date movie house in the Venado suburb. Industrial home for the blind, founded by the Lions Club of Havana. The new American Embassy building on the famous Malecon of Havana. Skyscrapers as high as 35 stories have been built throughout the city during the last few years. Most of them are residential, but some also furnish space for offices and stores. In 1948, the value of new construction throughout the island amounted to 43 million pesos. In 1954, it exceeded 70 million pesos. Cuba is a sport-loving country. At the beautiful Marianao racetrack, racing fans follow enthusiastically the sport of kings. Boxing is most popular. Cuban boxers have beaten some of the best boxers in the world. Baseball, however, is the favorite national sport in Cuba. At the new Cerro Stadium, crowds up to 36,000 fans gather to cheer the Sugar Kings, Havana and Almendares teams, as well as many amateur players. Now, let us have a look at the industrial life of the country. Cuban tobacco is recognized everywhere as the best in the world. In this factory, the selected leaf of well tabaco is converted into cigarettes. Present consumption totals around 600 million packages annually. Coffee growing is one of Cuba's main industries. Output today meets the domestic requirements and after many years, Cuba again has coffee available for export. In 1954, Cuba imported 120 million feet of lumber. Pre-mixed concrete production started in 1947. Reinforced concrete is almost completely used in construction, replacing the steel girder type of former years. Concrete plays an important part in the construction of highways and streets. The shoe industry has developed on a big scale. In 1948, it turned out 8 million pairs of shoes. In 1954, the output was 14 million pairs. The fabrication of duraluminum for industrial purposes is a new venture in Cuba. Carlos Finley laid the foundation stone of modern Cuban medical science. There are over 180 pharmaceutical laboratories in the country. The manufacture of soft drinks has grown tremendously. In Cuba, there are 58 factories engaged in the manufacture of jerked beef, sausages, and canned meats.
paper and uh, newsprint consumption is very high in Cuba. This is a large mill. A rubber tire factory. Tire consumption has doubled in the past six years. One third of the demand is produced in the island. Two-thirds of the wheat flour consumed in Cuba is milled at this plant in Regla. Pottery and ceramics industries flourish in the interior of the island with principal centers in Calabasar, Trinidad, Camagüey, and Santiago de Cuba. A textile factory, the young and vigorous textile industry can compare with the best in Latin America. The brewery industry has increased considerably especially in the last 10 year cycle of industrial and economic development and national breweries have constructed new plants to meet the growing demand for beer. In 1954, production exceeded 120 million liters. Commercial activities in Havana have kept pace with the industrial development. At up-to-date and comfortable stores, many of them air-conditioned, pretty girls serve the customers who may buy all kinds of goods, ranging from aluminum container to an exclusive dress designed by Christian Dior. The beautiful swimming pool at the famous Havana Hotel. Holiday makers, most of them tourists, charmed by the attractions of Cuba, take a dip in the pool and bask in the sun.
By the time 29-year-old Alexander Messer arrived in Cuba's Santiago de Cuba from San Pedro de Macorí in the Dominican Republic, he had already been living abroad for a decade. Born on St. Croix, Danish West Indies to Christian Messer and Andrina Prince Messer, Alexander, a musician and sugarcane laborer, first left his homeland in 1908 at the age of 19 settling in the Dominican Republic and working at the American-owned Consuelo Sugar Estate. He returned to St. Croix to visit his family for three months in 1914 and then again in 1917. But when he migrated to Cuba in 1918, he never again returned to St. Croix. But it was Alexander's love for St. Croix and his family that served as the impetus for his collection of Henry Clay and Bach and Company limited postales para el album, a gift series consisting of hundreds of self-captioned keepsake picture cards of Cuba issued by the Havana-based cigar company in 1925 to its special customers. Alexander was not known to the family to be a smoker, and given his humble status in Cuba, it is unlikely that he was a preferred or special client of the Henry Clay and Bach and Company limited cigar company. Thus, how Alexander came in possession of the cards has been lost to history. What is known, however, is that beginning in the mid-1920s, in an attempt to share his adopted Cuban homeland with his family in the land of his birth, he would occasionally enclose the Cuba series picture cards in his letters home to his parents and siblings. Alexander's younger brother, Alfonso Messer, born 1896, safeguarded the photos for a half century at the Prince Messer ancestral home in Frederickstead St. Croix until his death in 1973. The nascent collection of approximately 100 photographs then passed to Wayne James, great nephew of Alexander and Alfonso. Though only 11 years old at the time of the inheritance, James recognized the historic and nostalgic value in the photos and preserved them. Then, in the summer of 2005, while frolicking in Ibiza and visiting a friend in Barcelona, James strolled into a quaint antique shop in old Barcelona, not far from the Pablo Picasso Museum, and found a cache of approximately 250 of the Cuba series photos. He bought the photos. In 2009, while visiting Cuba in his capacity of Senator of the United States Virgin Islands, Wayne James donated a copy of his collection to the Library of the University of Havana, which at the time had no archival knowledge of the existence of the Cuba series. In the summer of 2020, James again serendipitously came upon a collection of 150 of the photos in a Spanish auction house and successfully bid on the photos, thereby increasing his collection to more than 450 images. The collection is now believed to be the world's largest. In 2019, inspired by his dear, dear Cuban friend, Luis C. Garcia Menocal, great-grandson of Mario Garcia Menocal, Cuba's third president, 1913 to 1921, James decided to share the collection with the people of Cuba and the world. Going, going, gone, the grandeur of Golden Age Cuba is the result of that inspiration.
the world, this was Cuba, a land of song and dance and gaiety, a land of friendly people. The charm, the fame of this tropical island, this paradise of the Caribbean, made Cuba one of the great tourist attractions of the world and made friends for Cuban people everywhere.
Cuba's visitors from other lands were impressed by Havana, one of the liveliest cities of the Americas. They found that in the first half of the 20th century, the Cuban people had built a modern nation. Their skills had built industries and made Cuba's standard of living as high as any in Latin America. Visitors who toured the countryside found other evidences of wealth, the sugar and tobacco, which Cuba could trade for industrial and consumer products of other nations. They saw modern agricultural methods applied to a rich soil in an ideal climate. An abundance of crops of cattle, poultry, and modern dairy farms. Enough food, it would seem, for all. But far from the gaiety of Havana, concealed by the agricultural wealth, there were things the visitors did not see, did not know about. Throughout this wealthy island paradise, thousands of Cubans lived in wretched poverty. This poverty was bad enough, but to the Cuban people there was a greater evil. For 60 years, the Cuban people had lived under a succession of corrupt and often dictatorial rulers. The latest and worst of these was Batista. He had turned Cuba into a police state.
first films of Cuban rebel leader Fidel Castro and his ragged force in their mountain stronghold, made shortly before fighting erupted in all six of Cuba's provinces. This is the band, numbered at about 1,000, that for 16 months has held out in the rugged Sierra Maestre mountains near the island's eastern tip. Ill-supplied, they make many of their weapons in crude jungle workshops. Mines and grenades made here have proved as unreliable as they are makeshift. One of Castro's most potent weapons has been the mimeograph. Pronouncements and propaganda have circulated throughout Cuba by pamphlets and by radio, despite secret police efforts to stamp out the underground. Castro himself has become a figure of legend in the 16 months since he invaded Oriente province from a small boat. The rebels' actual achievements were few for most of that time, but by mere existence and survival, Castro's force has both grown and exerted an influence out of all proportion to its size. Castro's plan of action? To fight by any means until the Batista regime is toppled. Sabotage proved effective in paralyzing Oriente province for weeks before the general outbreak of fighting. And Oriente is the province most remote from the heart of the country. The ragged, underfed, poorly armed rebels cut off communications and supply lines in a campaign of sniping and sabotage. But every time they have clashed in the open with Batista's hard, efficient army and national police, the rebels have lost heavily. Despite losses, they have fought on and their numbers grow. Today, an estimated one man in ten carries a modern rifle. The United States has embargoed arms for both sides. Occasional shipments are smuggled through from rebel sympathizers. It is an unequal battle of idealists against tough professional forces. As Castro, if I lose, I'll start over again. If Batista loses, he loses for good. Cuba's strong man, who appeared with his family at a press reception, seemed untroubled by Castro's mounting offensive. Behind Batista stand the army, the police, and apparently Cuba's labor unions, who withheld support from Castro's general strike call. Batista seemed upset about reports in the American press of police brutality and corruption but confident in the face of an unpredictable future. For seven years, the resistance of the Cuban people mounted. Fidel Castro emerged as the leader of the resistance movement. Cubans of all classes joined the guerrilla bands forming in the mountains and in the underground and in the city. Excitement and hope spread among the people as the fighting at last began to turn against Batista's soldiers. On January 1st, 1959, Batista the dictator was overthrown. Fidel Castro's arrival in Havana was triumphant. He was the hero, the liberator of the Cuban people. He promised them the things they had longed for and had fought for. Elections, land reform, freedom. An end to oppression and bitter poverty. He promised that every Cuban would at last enjoy the rights guaranteed under the Constitution of 1940. The future looked bright when Manuel Urrutia, a greatly respected judge and a liberal, was named president. When Castro went soon to the United States, he was greeted enthusiastically as a Cuban nationalist hero. He paid his respects to Abraham Lincoln, to government of the people, by the people, and for the people. At a press conference in Washington, Castro denied a rumor that he was a communist. I know you are worried. First of all, if we are communists, 
And of course, I have said very clear that we are not communists. Very clear. But for a man who denied he was a communist, Castro back in Havana acted strangely. He made veiled threats against any hint of opposition to a people still shocked by the terror of mock trials and executions. He began attacks on the press, which led finally to confiscation and complete government control. As the free press disappeared, the communist paper Hoy was forced upon the people. Communist propaganda flooded the country. In January 1960, the Soviet deputy premier, Anastas Mukayan, came to Havana. The stage had been set for him. Mukayan opened a Russian trade fair. He discussed deals with Cuba. By the time he had put this hat on his head, he had the Cuban economy in his pocket. In Moscow, an agreement was signed for the exchange of Soviet machinery and technicians for Cuba's sugar and other big money crops. The agreement was signed for Cuba, not by a Cuban, but by a communist from Argentina, Che Guevara. From now on, the Cuban economy would go into a critical decline. The life of the Cuban people would become harder than ever. To the hungry Cuban people, the Russian ships brought guns, and more guns. As weapons continued to pour in, life got harder for the Cuban people. There was less food, but there were more and more Russian tanks. Fidel Castro, face the nation. In the early hours of yesterday morning, this was the scene in a studio of television station CMQ in Havana, Cuba. The revolution is over and the studio is jammed with newspaper photographers, armed guards, studio technicians, armed rebel fighters. From this studio in Havana, you are about to see Fidel Castro, leader of the successful rebel forces who overthrew the dictatorship of General Batista. And now, by television tape recording, you will see Fidel Castro face the nation. Now, here is the moderator of Face the Nation, CBS News correspondent, Stuart Novins. The revolution in Cuba has thrown out the Batista administration, and it has installed a provisional government. That was the first step. Now, the revolution must consolidate itself the government must be organized to cope with the many, many problems that now face this country. The man upon whose strength all this depends is Dr. Fidel Castro, who is here now to face the nation. Dr. Castro, the American people hope that a true democracy will emerge here in Cuba. We want to ask you about your personal plans and about what you hope for your country. In order to do that, we're here in this special edition of Face the Nation, and the gentleman I want to identify on your side is there to help you with language if you need it, and I'm sure you won't. May I introduce our panel of newsmen, Dr. Castro? Jay Mallon of Time Magazine, Richard Bate of CBS News, 
William L. Ryan of the Associated Press, who will ask the first question. <laughs> Mr. Ryan? Dr. Castro, the recent events in Cuba have been full of hope for the Cuban people. But is this hopeful revolution now being threatened by some person or persons within the revolutionary organizations? Our interpreter on the special edition is Mr. Jack Skelly, who has lived here in Cuba for 25 years, a former UP correspondent in Washington. Well, I want to tell you, the government, the president of Cuba now is consolidated in the power and have the help of the biggest movement <coughs> and of the public opinion. That is the 26th of July yes, movement, Doctor. and many other organi and other organizations. And he is sure in power. The only thing worrying me is, are, is some group that is keeping and and I ask it I spoke to the polling opinion and he asked why to give ban if there is no tyranny. I asked for they uh, give the arm, turn the arms again, and they said they are going to to give the arm. Doctor, just is, there is no difficult at all because public opinion in Cuba is now very strong and with a tremendous force. Nobody is enough powerful to op opposite now the public opinion of the free country of Cuba. Doctor, just for clarification, this group that has been carrying arms, is this the student group, the university group? Not the university group, because the students are almost... How do you listed. identify this group, Doctor? A group that uh, several years ago they were students. Now they, now they are not students, and not all day. Two or three day leaders that I am surely that they are men, the men are not going to follow themselves. They this is the group of Fore Chamon. Yes, but Fore Chamon is going to be to fall in crisis. Crisis? In crisis. Yes. Because the group is a group of young, idealistic, and uh, good men. Mr. Bate, is this, this the is my same opinion. Group? They cannot do anything at all. It will not uh, be another thing than a, a, a word war. Dr. Castro, is this you the know? same group that... Not uh, call. Is this the same group, however, that uh, you spoke of the other night when you said someone had stolen some arms from an arsenal near Cuba? Yes. Have you gotten those arms back? Yes, they said they were to turn back then. They cannot do anything because of you have re all the mother of Cuba has said that it's not necessary that I send a soldiers to take our soldiers to take the arms because they are decided to go and to take the arms. That is what the mothers of Cuba say, you know, and they cannot do anything. Public opinion is powerful in Cuba and nobody can opposite public opinion in this time. What they do is to be with the public opinion that have a confidence in our movement and in myself and in the provisional government. That is why I think that we will have no trouble. Do you know why? Because we have the power, the forces, the army force, and we are not, we are near the president. We help the president without condition. The civil government is sure. He gives orders to us, and we are decided to obey the orders because we are men of law, Doctor. not professional of, of the arms. Mr. Mallon? Is it clear? Yes, yes. Do you believe yes. that the public opinion will hear me in the United States and understand me? I am sure they will, Dr. Castro. I, I am not very much sure. Of your English, you mean. <laughs> I think to improve for next time. Very good, but you're doing very well now. Mr. Mellon? Dr. Castro, do you believe that the directorio will surrender these arms uh, voluntarily? No, they are men that are good men, young men. 
will not do anything against the revolution. And they, m many of them think in good, well, and love the revolution and the country. There are two or three leaders, small leaders with big ambitions. That is all, and not difficult at all. You can be sure that will not be difficult. I know quite well my country. I know quite well my people. I know quite well the public opinion. I, I know that who rule in Cuba now, who gives orders now in Cuba, is the public opinion with the free press as the vehicle, as the, 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 the vehicle. Way, way. Yes. Dr. Castro, Castro uh, yes, <laughs> go ahead, Mr. Arn. Uh, just what are the ambitions of these leaders? Just what do they want specifically? Nobody knows. What they, what they want is to, to worry. To, to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, they want, what they want is something as name. And I suppose that as they see the 26th July movement as the help of all the public opinion. You have seen, did you see yesterday the people? Dr. Hundred, Castro. Hundreds of thousands of people were in the street. They saw that. Those two or three leaders, and they cannot be happy. What they want is to give us headache. <laughs> Dr. Castro, I think there's no doubt that your 26th of July movement is the best organized group and perhaps the largest group, but does that mean that you intend to run the government by yourself? Or will there be... Myself? Uh, not you, but your party. Will there be participation of other political not parties? Not big participation, because the president wanted to design the, the majority of the minister, of the member of the government, he, he asked us to help him. He asked us so that we permit that our men take part, take part in the government. At the beginning, we were not interested. Well, what about the directorio, Dr. Castro? Will they also have positions in the ministers, in the ministry, in the cabinet? Well, the president, when when we we elected him, <coughs> it was without condition, you know? And what happened is this. <coughs> if this small group, you give participation in two or three months, if they want, they say this is not good for anything, you give they, you give they participation, they use that to produce a crisis. It is better for the, for the government, for the surely, and for the, the development, the development of the, go, the provisional government, so that we have not possibility of crisis. You think you it know? is the purpose of the directorio to create a real crisis in Cuba so that they can take no. over power? Is that what you're saying? Two or three small leaders yes. that are trying to produce, not, not to produce the crisis, are trying to play with fire. Do you know? Yes. So they, that they will not go very far because nobody follow those kind of people. Dr. Castro, you said that yes. in... Uh, that you, is the truth. You Maro. said that in 18 months or so there will be free elections in Cuba. When yes. this time comes, will, uh, the, will all political parties be allowed to run candidates in these elections? Yes, of course. All political parties, including the directorial. Of course, if we don't give free to all the political parties to organize, we are not a dem democratic uh, country. We have fought for the democracy here and, and for the free, for the freedom Why of our people. We don't want to stop and to put any difficulty to anybody. Why we believe in democracy. Why will it be necessary to wait 18 months before free elections can be held? Well. Do you, do you think it is good for the Cuba now, when all the people what want is peace, when all the people that what want is that the government repair 
the mistakes and the the barbarity of the before government. Don't you believe that if our country at least one year to work? Do you believe that between in the in the in the fight of the political party, is it possible to do anything? If we give a free election tomorrow, we win because we have almost all the people. We have now more people than in 18 years. Do because you after 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 18 years, I am sure many people are going to be tired Do you of feel me that and of everybody because people tire very very fast. But do you feel that there would be that trouble if free elections were held tomorrow in Cuba? Do you feel that you would rather have almost uh, over a year in order to uh, uh, consolidate things before free elections are held? Mm -hmm. I think it is good at about 18 months, not more and not less. Because, as you know, the political party need time for reorganize. Reorganize. Yes. And each, to work, each to make, pro to make propaganda, propaganda. But, Dr. Castro, what guarantees and are there then, after 18 months? What is the guarantee that there will be free elections after 18 hmm. months? Well, the public opinion in first place. Second place, our word. Third place, our intention that have been proved. Four things our because we are men without interest. Are you considering uh, revising yes, the and, and five because it is logic. What we win in not doing election. If we have the people, don't you believe we have the people of Cuba? Do you want to make a survey? Not at all. Okay. I, I'm, I you just have want to satisfy uh, my own curiosity in this respect. Uh, are you considering, for example, uh, revising the Constitution in any way to, to protect the rights which have been trampled on before? Why? Why? There is, it is not necessary at all. It is not necessary. Our Constitution, everybody in our country is happy with our Constitution. To yes. change the Constitution now is to provocate, to provocate to difficult. Provoke. Not people is not going to be quiet. And what the country needs is that everybody have confidence. And we have said our constitutional law is the Constitution of 1940. And everybody is happy and is sure and know what to do. Mr. Mr. Mellon. Uh, is it clear? Will the uh, communist or a communist front party be permitted to participate in the elections? What? <coughs> What I, th what I think about that is this, the, uh, when the tyranny was falling, in the country, they are, they, they are going to be the same right that were before 19, the 10th of March 10, 1952. And what I think that I, I this, that all the rights of the Constitution are ought to be come on, respect. 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 Are you afraid of the idea? Do you uh, believe that the, the democratic man ought to be afraid of any idea? Dr. Castro, I you are a man lawyer. Of faith. You are a lawyer and I'm afraid I will have to act as a judge. We'd like you to answer our questions. <laughs> Well, I am not afraid no, of freedom at all. May I ask you a question, sir? As a lawyer, and as one who has spoken very eloquently about the civil rights that yes. must be guaranteed to the Cuban yes. people, how do I you explain... I will never be against any right that is my think in politics. Very I am good. not communist at all, but I will never be against any right.
Well, may I ask you, sir, why is it when you have that attitude, which you obviously believe very strongly, why with that attitude have there been so many executions across Cuba without open free trials? What? Well, not so many. How many? I don't know exactly about why you... Two or three dozen of criminal. Because I think the judge is the first thing necessary for the happiness of the country. And because if somebody has killed 12 or 15 or 30 men, has no right at all to live. And you in the United States, when somebody kills one, you send it to the chair, electric chair. Yes, but it's After a trial. Why do you in the United States trial. kill so many people every year in the electric chair? Dr. Castro, <laughs> Do you permit me to ask you? After a trial. After trial, Dr. Castro. Doctor, we don't want to debate, but the <coughs> point that I'm trying to get your opinion on is this. There have been no of open course, trials. Of course. Exactly. By I trial, with proof, by trial, not without trial. In the military kind of tribunal. Course. They were judged. It's important that the American of people course, know that. That's why I'm asking. Surely, Certainly. You can be surely. We will never uh, punish anybody without trial. Trial. May I ask Dr. Castro... What happened is this. Yes. The proof are very easy. You want to go to some... For example, if you go to some small city, the captain of police have killed 20 men. A dozen of mother go to the trial to say, this killed my, my son, this killed my son, this killed... Everybody know. The proof is easy. But this is a military court, doctor? Yes, yes. yes. And another thing you ought to know, and if you don't know, you ought to ask and to informate public opinion of the United States that we in the war, you in the war, capturing thousands of prisoners and that we never kill it with. We never torture anyone. We never stroke anyone. That is a, a fact, a history fact here. Yeah. And you can be surely that overall we are, we are, we, we are, we are responsible. We respect yes. the Dr. human Castro, right. I ask you another and question. what we think is this, <coughs> that the criminal ought to be punished because we don't want that never again in our country. Criminal can be the chief of policemen and of the army. Mr. Dr. Castro, uh, we've heard that there uh, are soldiers now training in the Sierra Maestra. Uh, we've heard uh, your brother, as a matter of fact, made a statement that uh, the soldiers of the revolution were not going to immediately return to civilian life. Are, are these men being trained additional new troops for possible trouble in Cuba, or are they being trained uh, to possibly participate in other hot spots in the Caribbean? question is being interpreted. Not, huh? not, not, not. <coughs> we are training some groups of those men that were not regular soldiers of the revolution. And so that we joined them, they were with bad arms. Mm -hmm. And they were doing what they could again, tyranny. And what we have made is to take them, to join them, to disciplinate them as a matter of public order. How large an army do you feel Cuba needs in Not very times? big. Not very big because we have as army all the people of Cuba. When it be necessary to defend our country, here the men and the women fight. I think that everybody ought to be soldier of our country to defend our paid, paid but our country. That is why we don't need a big army. We need a, a small army for defense, for keeping the order when it be necessary, and to defend the country. 
Dr. Castro, what is the attitude of your group toward the Dominican Republic? What? What is the attitude of your group toward the Dominican Republic? Of course, we think that Trujillo is our enemy. We think that. It don't, does not mean that we are going to attack Trujillo. But Trujillo sent very much arms to Batista during the Civil War. And Trujillo is enemy of every democratic government. And Trujillo is always trying to do everything he can against democracy here in Cuba, in Venezuela, and in other countries. Trujillo is the enemy of all the... Would, would your country sell arms to a rebel movement in the Dominican Republic? I think, I think that the provisional government would not sell arms to for revolution. I think that what is interesting, and I, what I think, I would not say, I would give. <laughs> Mr. Ryan. Dr. Yes. Castro, may I well, shift to another well, subject? I, I, I want to tell you that it doesn't mean that I am going to give up. I see. You want to be, you, I want to be clear. I sympathize with the, the Dominican, but it is not necessary to buy arms to defeat a tyranny. We proved that it was not necessary. If the Dominican want, they alone are enough for defeating Trujillo. What they needed was the example, and we gave them the example. Would you give them Do some advice? Do you understand advice? now? Yes. Would you give them some advice in the form of some trained leaders, perhaps some field commanders, some military strategists? question being interpreted for Dr. Castro. No, no, no. What we want now is peace. We, what we want now is to pay attention to our things here. That is what we want now. Dr. Dr. Castro, could you tell us what your opinion is of United States policy during this period of your revolution? Well, well, do you want to tell you the truth? That's all we want. <laughs> I know. I, I sympathize with the people of the United States. Not us, because I want to, to win the people now. But really and sincerely, I think people of the United States will pick newsmen of the United States. You have no many during the war and after the war. And I have a wonderful opinion of all you. And about government of the United States, I think they were mistake. About Cuba, and about the United and the other countries of America. They armed dictator, believing it was a good political, because they didn't think what kind of people are those people of Latin America. What they think is the United States have been not worried at all about our feeling. Our democratic feeling, the United States is speaking about democracy and forgetting the feeling, democratic feeling of those countries of Latin America. Okay. And between them, Cuba. Do you see those Sherman tanks? Do you see those airplanes? Do you see those big bonds of 500 pounds? They were sold by government of the United States to Batista. And Batista was always telling to the soldier, to his soldier, the United States is with us. The United States is uh, helping us. The United States is giving arms to us, you know? And so he, he, um, <laughs> he didn't, never said the truth to the United States. And so he carried the arm, he carried his army, to the, to the complete destruction. Because he said, here, you see, there are the 10 officers, 12 officers here, training you, United States, help us, help me. And the soldiers believed the United States was helping them. Perfect. Well, Perfect. but the United States, I ought to recognize, I ought to recognize that the last year, United States changed his policy. United States 
Dean sent arms to Batista. Stop. But you asked me how was his politics. I said you the truth. I think it was a mistake. He stopped. It was good and we are happy for that. The United States recognized our government. It was good. We are happy for that. Do you understand? Yeah, is there any but truth to the story that... The United States changed. Is there any truth to the story that you've asked or are thinking about asking the recall of the American ambassador here? I cannot, I cannot ask for that because I am not the Minister of State, the Secretary of State. Do you know? I cannot answer you about that. Dr. Castro, I don't want to inter make intervention in the, in the government. There is one question I think you can answer very briefly. I understand that a businessman has offered you $25,000 for your beard. Did you accept the offer? <laughs> well, no, I am not going to sell my beard. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Castro, and thanks to Jay Mallon of Time Magazine, Dick Bate of CBS News, William L. Ryan of the Associated Press. This is Stuart Novins. We invite you to join us again for Face the Nation. Today's special edition came from Havana. Face the Nation was produced by Ted Ayers, associated in production with Frank Dongi and Roberta Wilkinson. The director for television station CMQ in Havana was Roberto Miranda. Today you saw by television recording Dr. Fidel Castro, leader of the rebel forces who overthrew the dictatorship of General Batista in Cuba, Face the Nation. Members of the panel who interviewed Dr. Castro were William L. Ryan of the Associated Press, Jay Mallon of Time Magazine, and Richard Bate of CBS News. The moderator was CBS News correspondent Stuart Nobins. Face the Nation is a weekly presentation of CBS News.
This is where 63-year-old Maria Elena Hernandez lives with her daughter and two granddaughters, a building that's barely standing, prevented from collapsing by wooden beams. When trucks go by, she tells me, everything starts shaking. Once a chocolate factory, the century-old building was converted into apartments after the revolution in 1959 and has seen better days. At first it was just dust falling. Then bathrooms fell, which is where the hole is. Then pieces here and there fell from the stairway, then inside the houses. The building's floor comes apart at the touch. Laundry dries in gaping holes where windows used to be. Residents who left are replaced by squatters. All over Havana, thousands of buildings like this one are disintegrating from lack of maintenance in Cuba's punishing tropical climate, sometimes with fatal results. Marilena had good reason to be afraid. In January, just a few blocks away from her apartment, the building that was here came crashing down, killing four people who were inside. Architect Mario Coyula says Cuba's efforts to save the aging buildings is outpaced by their decay. What's going on is that there is an accumulation of needs because the pace of deterioration doesn't stop, it increases. And there is a rhythm of uh, failures, of collapses. Many residents moved out of the old factory to new apartments they helped build. Health problems, Maria Elena says, prevented her from taking part in the construction. She refused the government's offer to move her family to cramped communal housing outside Havana. If I've been living here for 30 years, if my daughter and my granddaughter grew up here, I shouldn't have to move to the countryside. But not long after speaking with us, Maria Elena and the other inhabitants of the building were evicted by the government. Now cinder blocks bar the entrance. So at least if this building comes crashing down, no one will go with it. Patrick Ottman, CNN Havana.